This will we do, if God permit. Uh, run over to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, verse 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. I think sometimes we think faith is a, is a new covenant principle. It's not. If you read the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, you'll find that all the heroes of faith were Old Testament saints. So faith is not something that's new uh, under the new covenant. Faith has always been the means whereby God's people uh, actually came into contact with God and were used by God. It's the principle that God's always used. Uh, God's people have always had to walk by faith, whether they were in the old covenant or the new. It's not anything new. Uh, We talked about repentance, I think, a couple of times. Uh, We could have stayed on repentance for several weeks because there's a lot of different areas to cover. Most repentance in the body of Christ doesn't have to do with the unsaved. Most of repentance in the body of Christ deals with Christians. It is our repenting from dead works. Our repentance from dead works moving in faith toward God. In other words, repenting of dead religion. And I don't want to talk about that this morning, but that's probably one of the major portions of it. But I want to start on faith toward God. I'm not going to take a long time this morning, but, you know, if you taught on faith and really taught on it, I could teach on faith for a year and not cover it and preach three times a week. Uh, Still, you wouldn't cover all there is to know about faith because faith is something that is supernatural. Faith comes out of spiritual understanding. Our faith in God grows because our spiritual understanding in God grows. And you can't have faith without spiritual understanding. Once God gives you spiritual understanding, then you have to respond in faith to obey the thing that you've heard. If you don't obey what you've heard, you become a hearer only. And if you only hear and don't do, the Bible says you deceive yourselves. So I just want to talk about some really simple thoughts this morning. Uh, preached on prayer last time. And just like prayer can be put in three dimensions, faith can also be put in three dimensions. You can you can put faith in the outer court, you can put faith in the holy place, or you can put faith in the most holy place. Uh, the first realm of faith that we deal with when we come to God is, what can God do for me? Come on, is that right? When, when you first came to Christ, uh, you first got saved, your first initial contact with God was, what can God do for me? What is in it for me? If I turn my life over to this God, what can God do for me? Because most of us came to God, we were in a mess. How many agree with that? We were in a total, we were a total wreck. Life had wrecked us in one way or another. Even we, even if we were young when we came to the Lord, we knew there was something inside missing, and so we responded to God. We came to God. Why? Because we had a need. And so basically, that's the way we begin. We begin in the outer court, and our whole relationship with God is built on what God does for me. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, because it's associated with needs. It's what we can receive from God by our faith. Uh, that's basically where faith has been for about 30 years now. Uh, but I know that's a very limited view of faith. It's very limited. It has its limitations. Uh, that message of faith, that realm of faith, really is associated with the immature with the realm of children. Uh, 
because uh, when you're young, how many know when you're young, you want God to do something for you? And when children are young, I mean, they want their parents to do something for them. Is that right? And that's normal. Uh, there's different stages of children. There's padions, which is, and nepios, which are babies. And then you have the technons, which are like teenagers. Then you have the weos, which are mature sons. And then you have the paters, or paters, which are the fathers. And so there's different stages that we move through in our spiritual growth. And as we move through those stages of spiritual growth, our faith is supposed to grow as we grow. As we mature in God, our faith in God should mature. We shouldn't stay in the realm where all of our faith is directed toward what God can do for me in the meeting of my needs. Uh, a nepios is just a newborn, a newborn child. And though he may be a son, he's not a weos son. He's not a, he's not a son that you would entrust things to. He's a baby. A little child. A mature son does the business of the father. But a nepios doesn't even know what the business of the father is. I'm losing my volume here. Can y'all hear me all right? So we need to understand faith, what faith is. And I'll try to get us through there at least a little ways. But most of our teachers that we've had in the body of Christ who are teaching on faith deal with the realm of faith that's for the immature. Come on. What is most, most faith that's preached in the body of Christ is faith for what? Things, right? What we can get from God. What God can do for us. That's basically the realm of faith that's been taught. Been taught that way for 30 years. It's still in the place of immaturity. That's all I'm trying to say. Uh, Where it thinks mostly of what God can provide for us. That's where most faith has stayed right there. Even though... People believe they're really mature in faith, but their faith is only matured in a very immature level. Faith begins with the realm of what God can do for you, but it can't stay there. Because the Bible says, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So let me understand you have to mature in your understanding so that your faith matures so that you're not walking in sin. Are you with me? Okay. So we have to grow up. And part of growing up is, is realizing that God is dwelling in us and God intends to do His will in us and through us. John 5, 19, uh, very familiar scripture, but I'm going to read it so that I don't quote it wrong, even though we know it real well. But uh, in John 5, 19, Jesus said this. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son Likewise, I mean, that is a tremendous level of trust for a son. We don't think about that, but that is a very tremendously high level of trust for a son of God to walk in. Uh, Whatever God desires to do through you, you're also going to desire it and you're going to allow it to take place, and your trust in God is so total and so complete that you believe that what God is directing you to do is better than what you could direct yourself to do. In other words, the the plans, the purposes, the will of God for your life it's more important to you. It's greater for you. It's better for you than what you could do for your life. That's why Jesus said, I don't do anything of myself, but only what I see the Father do, do I do. I don't do anything of myself. I'll tell you what, that's a, it's very easy to say. 
Very easy to read that scripture and quote it. But that's a very high level of trust for a son of God to walk in to where he's made the determination or she's made the determination in her heart. Whatever God's will is for my life, whatever he chooses for me is better than what I would choose for myself. Amen. Hallelujah. So, your life in its entirety is better served in God's hands than in your own. In other words, some, somewhere down the way, you've submitted your life into the hands of God. And you've left it there because you believe that what He desires for you is better than what you could desire for yourself. Now, I may agree that's a, that's a very high level of trust. Because most of us, truth is, we want control of our lives by faith. In other words, so that we can convince God to do what we want Him to do. <laughs> See, that leaves your life in your hands. Hello. That's where most of the church is. That's the way we've taught faith. Because we're fearful of letting go. We're fearful of entrusting our life into God's hands and trusting Him. And so we're trying to manipulate God by our faith to do what we want God to do. Because the truth is, we don't want to give up control of our lives. We want to have control and call it faith. Okay, you can believe that or not, but I'm telling you the truth. That's why Jesus is the prototype of the Son of God. Most of what you hear taught in the faith realm today, Jesus never taught it, and He never operated in it. Most faith preachers would be out in the wilderness turning stones into bread, feeding the multitudes, and calling Charisma Magazine. Come on. It's this subtle thing that works in us that we keep our lives under our own control and we call it God. Okay. What Jesus walked in was total obedience to God. Total obedience to God. And that's different. So faith grows. Is it wrong to believe God for things? Is it wrong that you have needs, you believe in God to supply your needs? No, it's not wrong. God knows you have needs. But faith grows from God being the supplier of your needs, the preserver of your health, the one that protects you, provides for you, preserves you, keeps you, and it grows up into the place to where you trust in God. If I'm making sense to you, you have put your trust over into Him. And those things no longer occupy your mind. Okay. And in moving to a more mature realm of faith, you discover that God has a purpose for your life. Amen. Amen. Come on. And that He already planned. How many of God already planned the way that He will live in you and through you to accomplish His will? That was done from before the foundation of the world. God had already determined beforehand the works that He wanted you to walk in. That's Ephesians 2.10 if you don't believe me. So what God does is He brings us into that which suits our personality and He works through our personality to fulfill His will. He doesn't destroy it. He just changes us and makes us like Himself. All right. Amen. Anyway. What I'm trying to say is you become a member of the body of Christ. 
And as a member of the body of Christ, Christ becomes your head. And he is the one who is directing your life, whatever you're doing. And that becomes the way you operate by faith. So we're designed for God. That's what we're designed for. We're designed for God to bring us into his eternal purpose and for us to function in it. That's what God designed us for. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How many know faith for things is below that level of faith? Uh, That's a beginning. Uh, Anybody ever had a baby in diapers? Or been around a baby in diapers? A young child cannot speak. How many know how a child makes his needs known? (laughs) <laughs> makes lots of noise, doesn't he? Yeah. A young child, the only way that a child can express that he has a need is he cries and whines and complains. You've already got my message. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. Uh-huh, yeah. And what, have you ever seen a child express their anger and throw their little temper tantrums? Yeah. And the reason a child does that is he hasn't yet been disciplined. He hasn't yet learned to discipline himself. He's not old enough yet. And it's up to you as the parent to work that out in the child. As the child grows and matures, it's the work of the parent to mature that child and to discipline that child so that the way he gets his needs met is no longer crying, complaining, and throwing temper tantrums. He has a different approach. Amen. I tell you what, if a child does that, when he's a teenager, you're going to have to stand against it. And it's going to be much, much harder. Those things should have been worked out a long time ago. Because I know teenagers that still cry and complain and throw temper tantrums when they don't get their way. And then they wonder why. You just don't trust me! You just don't give me any space. You don't treat me like I'm a your home. Uh, no wonder. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'm going to prove to my mother I'm a tear until she says no. And then you go out, storm, slam the door. <laughs> I never, I never let me do anything I want to do. You just proved how immature you are. <laughs> so if you don't take a child and discipline the child, he won't ever come to maturity. It won't ever happen. He'll never understand how to advance to the next level of maturity. As you grow, as you mature, your faith is supposed to grow and mature in God. Amen? Faith never changes. It's always the same. But the application of it changes. How you apply it, that changes. And guess what? As you grow and mature, God will withhold what He used to supply to force your application of faith to mature. Hmm. Hebrews 11.1, one, why does it say the definition of faith is? Well, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> you ever read that? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, thank you. Thank you for that definition. 
What does that mean? What does that mean? We go into the Greek and we figure out what that word means. Is that going to do it? Let me ask you something. Have you ever had things, things in your life that you prayed for? Anybody ever had anything they prayed for? Anybody? Did you ever pray for a wife or a husband? Come on. Have you ever prayed, you know, Lord, you know, give me a husband or Lord, give me a wife? That in itself ought to taught you some lessons. <laughs> I'm glad my wife's not here. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you what, in the early days, there were in my life what I thought were some great difficulties and challenges. And you had to face them. I know you had to face those challenges that came in your life. Like when you got married, you started having children. I mean, there were challenges that come into your life. You had to face them. And you had to trust God for some of the things in your life. Am I right? There were needs that you had that you had to go to God in prayer for and believe God for. Paying bills. Hello. Training up children. If there's a parent that hadn't cried out to God for help training children, then I don't know what you're doing. And I tell you what, every parent needs help. I cried out for a lot of help. Learning how to relate to my wife. I needed God's help. Hello. Challenges that came in our life. We needed God's help. God had to come through for us. But in through all those things, I learned something. Through all the challenges of life that I faced in the early days, I learned something. The thing I learned was I could trust God. Come on, I learned through my life, facing the challenges that we faced, praying to God for God to bring answers and for God to meet needs, I learned something. God's good. God is good. I learned the goodness and faithfulness of God. I learned through all those things I went through that I could trust God. That God could provide for my needs. There were ways He answered me. And if you ask me today where the answer come from, I couldn't tell you. Come on. There were times we prayed for money to pay bills, and where it came from, I don't even know. I don't even know how we got through some of those things, but we did. God provided. I learned that God loved me. I learned that God is good. I learned that God answers prayer. And I learned that He's faithful. So in later years, when I had to make a decision about my security (laughs) and my family's security, which at that time was in the phone company, I believed God could provide. I spent two years wrestling that out. God was saying, lay it all down. Go into ministry full time. Oh, God, no. I've got a half a million dollars retirement coming if I'll just stay with it. Maybe more by the time I get there. God said, lay it down. That's not your security. You can die tomorrow. Oh, yeah. But you know what I could do? I could stop. And I could look back down the road in my life at God's goodness and God's faithfulness 
that he always provided. Amen. And you know what? I had to determine in my heart, God is still faithful. He's still good. He'll still provide. Oh, yeah. At every place and stage of life, you learn God can be trusted. Was it easy? No, it wasn't easy. It was a challenge. It was a step I had to take. And when I had to deal with all the other things that came because of that, that's where the rub was. Lack disappointments, back operations, problems in the church, betrayal through people that you thought were your friends, all kinds of other problems. What do you do when you choose to go the way that God shows you And there is no evidence around you to convince you that what you believe was the will of God is actually taking place. There's nothing to confirm what you believe about the call of God. There's nothing in your circumstances to confirm it. In fact, everything looks like it's fell apart now. Are you with me? When you're called to preach the gospel and you can't get out of bed, honey, because you hurt so bad you can't even go to the bathroom, you have to use a bedpan. And you lay there for weeks and weeks and weeks. I'm going to tell you what, you'll start doubting that you heard the voice of God. What do you do then? Come on. You stand and you trust in the goodness and the faithfulness of God that you know God has shown you up to that point. That's what you do. What is faith? It's evidence of things not seen. It's your evidence that there's an unseen realm that you've drawn out of time and time and time again, and you know it's real. You can't see it. You can't put your hand on it. You can't explain it. You can't uh, break it down and put it in its components, but you know it's real. Amen. I like the Greek word for evidence. It's this Greek word called elankos. What it really means is it's translated reproof or rebuke. It's a rebuttal that you have on the inside that rebuts all the other evidence to the contrary. No, God said it. That's the way it is. But it don't look like it. I'm not living out of this realm. I'm not living out of what's seen. I'm living out of what's unseen. I'm not setting my eyes on what's out here. I'm setting my eyes and my heart on what God has said. In other words, you go to court and somebody has evidence, and you refute their evidence with greater evidence. That's what it means. You have a greater evidence that you have to refute all their arguments. That's faith. The faith in your heart is the repudiation of everything that looks against what God has said. Amen. Is that all right? Evidence is a legal term. You go to court with an adversary, you better have evidence. Amen. 
you have to present the evidence in support of your cause. And then if you have a judge or a jury, they weigh the evidence to see who has the most evidence, and the one who has the most factual evidence wins. Hallelujah. And you've got to present it to people that have no knowledge of your circumstances. In fact, if they have knowledge, they're disqualified. So you had to present that evidence to them. That what you're saying is real. That there is an unseen realm that you're living out of. Amen. Your evidence is things not seen. <laughs> oh, Lord. <clears throat> so you have to present facts that the spiritual realm actually exists. Are you with me? And that you're actually drawing out of that spiritual realm. You're actually drawing something out of there. You have evidence. <clears throat> that it really exists. And the evidence suggests and it proves you can rely on this reality that you can't see. You can absolutely rely on the unseen. Hallelujah. I mean, you can't see the kingdom of God. If they say, look here or look there, and ain't where you going to find it. <clears throat> Is that right? The kingdom of God's not here nor there. The kingdom of God's not meat nor drink. The kingdom of God's within you. The reality of it's in here. It came by the Spirit of God. It lives within me. I have the spiritual evidence in me that the kingdom of God exists. How? I have righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen. It does exist. <clears throat> and you can tell people, no, <clears throat> this unseen realm, the kingdom of God, it does exist. And you know what they're going to say? How do you know that? <laughs> because God has brought evidence into my life of the reality of this unseen realm. I have evidence through my life that God is real. Amen. I have seen and I have felt God's love. I have seen God's promises come to pass. I have seen the provision of God come into my life. I have seen God's faithfulness. I've seen His goodness. I've been in His presence. I know it's real. You know what? That's what brings you the power to overcome. That's the peace, the Bible says, that guards your heart and mind. And it's a joy that's spiritual in nature. It's a joy that comes in your spirit. And nobody can take that away from you. Praise the Lord. Faith is not something that you wish would happen. Oh, I, I'm hoping. I'm, I wish it would happen. That's not faith. Faith is substance. Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the, literally in the Greek says it is the substantiating of what you're hoping for. It's holding up what you're hoping for. <clears throat> How does it do that? In the course of your life. It substantiates to you that it's real. You've had the, the evidence. Are you with me? You understand what I'm saying? It's invisible. 
Pretty much invisible. But your life contains evidence that even though you may not fully understand it, you know it's real. Come on, y'all have had experiences. Go look at me like that. <coughs> As Kelly Warner said, like a deer caught in the headlights. Don't look at me like that. You know what I'm talking about. You've had experiences in your own life where you know there was no other answer but God, and God came through. God was faithful, and He came through. And you know that realm exists. You can't see it. You may not fully understand it. You may not fully can express it, but it's real. You have evidence of it in your life. And that evidence turns into something. It turns into the substance of things hoped for. Amen. It's substance. <clears throat> All of us have had our own individual encounters with God. Every one of us. We've learned through our own experience that God is good. We prayed for a need. God met it. Prayed for a friend. He got saved or He got healed. Prayed for a family member. They got saved. They got healed. Something happened to them. They had a need met. You think about a friend that you hadn't heard from in years, and you're thinking, oh, I wish that guy would call me. Pray, Lord, let that guy call me. I hadn't heard from him in years. Ring, the phone rings, and you answered. Why? God's evidencing in your life that the realm of the spiritual realm is real, that the eternal is actual. God's giving you a body of evidence that the kingdom of God is real. Amen. And what God wants you to do is to develop in you a faith in His goodness and in His faithfulness. Do you understand what I'm saying? God wants to mature a faith in you that rests upon God's goodness and God's faithfulness to you throughout your life. If it's not developed in you, then over and over and over again, what you're having to do is you're having to learn the rudiments of faith all over again. When you're a child, God allows you to learn faith in that realm. When you're a child, you think as a child. You act like a child. You have faith as a child. <clears throat> Your whole approach to God is, how can God provide for me? But as you mature, you've got to grow up in your faith too. Your faith matures. Come here, we've all been introduced to faith at the level of a child, every one of us. That's where we started. Believe in God that He would provide some need that we had. The problem is, we stayed there. That's the big problem in the church right now. We have stayed right there in that outer court realm asking God to meet our needs. That's what most Facebooks out there talk about. How to make God do what you want Him to do. they got four steps you can do that. And sometimes four steps won't work, so they got seven steps. We don't know faith beyond the realm of children in Christian religion. Are you with me? Let me just read this scripture. Don't have anything to do with what I'm going to say, but I'm just going to read it anyway because it sounded good. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. We talked about this. I'm going to read it. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perishes, perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, <clears throat> worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, 
but the things which are not seen are eternal. In other words, God has given us eyes of faith so that we can see the unseen realm. Through the eyes of faith, we can see the unseen realm. And God reveals that realm to us to convince us it's real, to convince us of His love, and to convince us of His faithfulness and His goodness. Are you with me? I said that 14 times, we'll say 14 more. God begins with revealing this unseen realm as the source of your provision. That's the first way that we have that unseen realm revealed to us, that God comes to meet our need. The language of a child is crying, whining, and complaining. Why? They don't have any other way to announce that they have a need. When you're mature, you're not meant to cry and whine and complain. Well, by that time, you should have acquired some better skills. Why? Because you've matured. So our faith has to stay up with our growth of understanding in God. And sometimes God forces the issue. So God moves away from answering our needs. And we cry, whine, and complain some more. God said, you're not getting the message. So it just backs up a little bit further. And He keeps backing up until we get it. I'm telling you the truth. Why? Because He wants to move our focus away from our needs. Do we still have needs? Yes, we have needs. There's a higher level. How many know there's a higher level in God than praying for your needs? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be what? Added unto you. You don't even have to ask for them. They'll be added. So if God seems to stop in those areas, ask yourself, uh, where am I seeing the faithfulness and the goodness of God? It's not, I'm crying, whining, and complaining. He ain't answering my needs. But wait a minute. Where am I seeing the goodness and the faithfulness of God? Right now. Where am I seeing that in my life right now? Perhaps He's teaching you His goodness in the realm of understanding and wisdom and power. Are you with me? So somebody asks you a question about God. He asks you some question that, wow, Lord, how do I answer that? And all of a sudden, God drops the wisdom down into your mind to answer the question that's on a person's heart. Are you with me? And you go on, and you go home and you say, Hey God, what's going on? I can't get an answer about my needs, and you turn around and give me wisdom for somebody else. What's going on here? What's going on is God's taking you up another step in the maturing of faith in your life. I'm going to make a sense to you. He's making us grow up. That's where the church is right now. And we are kicking and screaming and throwing our little temper tantrums. But after a while, you begin to understand. You begin to see God's release in faith according to your call in the body of Christ. 
It's a higher level of faith. God says, I'm trying to show you. Seek the kingdom of God first, and I'll meet your needs. I'll supply your needs. But I'm taking you somewhere. Quit trying to restrict me to the days of your infancy. You want to know where we are in the body of Christ right now? That's where we are. God has determined it's time for the body of Christ to grow up. And I tell you what, when God determines a thing, (laughs) ain't nobody going to undetermine it. He's immutable. He ain't going to change his mind. God says, see what I'm doing in your life right now. That's what's important. See what I'm doing in your life right now. Take your eyes off of this out here and put it on the unseen realm. That's why we need the foundation of faith. So that as we transition, we don't try to hold on to what we knew of God in our immaturity. Amen. When you move into the mature realm where God is, God gives you insight into the mysteries of Christ. Why did Paul pray for the church, remember? Wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Remember that prayer? I'm praying God will give you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of Him. Praise the Lord. You don't get that as a child. Come on, God's not going to give that to you as a child because you don't know how to handle it. Nobody would listen to a proud child. Come on. You'd go around boasting about what you knew, and then you'd complain about what you asked that you hadn't received. Hello. Yeah. So now, guess what? I just pursue the kingdom of God, and God does the rest. Praise the Lord. That's a good place to be. It's a good place to be. He still takes care of all the rest. Until what God promised? God promised we'd seek the kingdom of God first. He'd take care of all the other things. He said, I'll take care of those. But my point is, our faith has to increase and mature. God wants our faith matured. What conclusion do we draw? We have an abundance of evidence Never to doubt the reality of the kingdom of God. God has given us enough evidence in our lives that we would never doubt the reality of the kingdom. That the kingdom exists. It's real. Faith is your evidence in your life. Not not my faith, your faith. That you can rely on the unseen. I'm making sense to you. Faith is the evidence in your life, in my life, that I can rely on what's unseen because I have seen the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Amen. It's real. I don't have to see it to believe it. It's not here, and it's not there. It's an unseen reality. It can't be measured. It can't be captured. It can't be quantified. It can't be defined by the natural realm. But it can never be doubted to exist. Why? We've seen the evidence of it in our lives too many times. 
Amen? So let's look at the other part, what it says about faith. It's not just evidence. What is it? It's substance. It's the substance of things hoped for. What if God tells you something that's yet to be fulfilled? How do you respond? Well, I have seen throughout my life the goodness and the faithfulness of God. That's the reality that I have. So should I worry? If God told me something and ain't come to pass, should I worry? Should I wring my hands? Should I fret about it? Get nervous? Should I get upset? Should I start complaining? No. We ought to be making plans for when it comes. Hello? Not only do I have evidence of his past dealings, but there is also a certainty of what God has told me. It's a substance of what you hope for. Amen. Am I making sense? Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope isn't saying, oh, I I hope someday it comes back. Oh, I hope I get that. That's not hope. That's not biblical hope. It's a certainty of what's coming in the future. Expectation would be a better word. There is an expectation of what God's bringing in the future. Amen? And it's as certain to you as everything you've seen God do in your life up to that point. Amen. He promises, and you just wait. You wait in certainty and in patience for the timing of God to bring it to pass. Why? Because your faith is not just evidence of things not seen, but because of the evidence of things not seen, there is substance of things hoped for on the inside of you. There's divine substance called faith that God's good and God's faith. Amen. Amen. That's just it's just that simple. And in the waiting period, you allow God to do in your life what's necessary to prepare you to receive what's coming and use it properly. Yeah. Why? Because that faith, that substance, transforms you. Changes you. And you're not anxious. You're not troubled. You're confident. You're confident on the inside that you can hear God and that what He says to you, He'll do it. Why? You have a track record of evidence in your life. Hallelujah. God says it. He fulfills it. And your life is filled with the evidence of the goodness of God. Amen. And then what happens? Your trust in the living God grows and it matures. And so when you run into this thing where what you're hoping for hasn't come yet, you don't get fretful, you don't get worried, you don't get anxious, you don't complain, you don't get bitter, you don't get angry. You have a body of evidence in your life on the inside of you, faith that's been developed in you, that what God says He'll do it. Because you've seen Him do it all through your life. 
And so that substance on the inside of you, it comes to rest in the goodness of God. You learn God's character. You learn God's nature. His goodness. His willingness to make Himself known to you. Amen? You learn faith to believe. You learn faith to function where God's put you. You learn faith to fellowship with God. He not walked with God. He was not because God took him. Honey, that's fellowship. You learn faith to trust. And your faith in God leads you to a place of rest. Come on. Leads you to a place of rest where you just rest your heart in the goodness and faithfulness of God. What God has said, He will do it. I want to read you this little deal. doesn't have anything to do with what I just said, but I want to read it to you. Uh, by Brother George Warnock up in uh, Canada. He's probably in his 90s now. I don't even know if it's his early 90s or late 90s. He's still going. I used to write him once in a while, but I hadn't been in touch with him for several years. But This is an excerpt from the Feast of Tabernacles book. I'm going to read this and I'm going to be quiet. Uh, he wrote this Feast of Tabernacles book in 1951. He was 20-something years old. Probably one of the classic works uh, on, on the Feast of Tabernacles. But he says, Truly the Lord has prepared great and mighty things for His people, things which eye has not seen or ear heard and which have not entered into the heart of man. 1 Corinthians 2, nine. If God's true children would only believe this one Scripture with all their hearts, how greatly it would help to release the riches of heaven and unlock the floodgates of glory. We know, of course, that Christians everywhere loudly profess to believe this as well as the rest of the Bible, but in actuality, they do not believe it. Yes, they will acknowledge that God has some great and mighty things prepared for us when we get to heaven. But Paul declares in the following verse that these unseen, unheard of, and unthought of things are revealed by the Spirit and not by way of rapture or death. Let us therefore give all diligence to enter into the realm of the Spirit, which constitutes the real heritage of the saints. Truly the heritage is ours for the possession. And if no man from the ascension of Christ until now has entered into it, it still does not make any difference. The fact remains, it is ours for conquest, if we can believe for it and receive it. The universal church has rejected the possibility of possessing it. That's true. But the history of the church is by no means the pattern of spiritual attainment. Paul did not fully apprehend it either. That is true. But he beheld the glory of it. Nevertheless, like Moses who stood on Mount Nebo and viewed the promised land, and furthermore he pressed forward with all diligence by the Spirit, if by any means he could apprehend it and confess that he had not done so. Thank God, however, for the assurance that some are going to possess the land. God is not going to close this dispensation until some really enter in and possess their heritage in Christ Jesus. Paul declared, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. Hebrews 4.6 first generation that came out of Egypt by Moses failed to enter in because of unbelief, and God decreed that they should die in the wilderness. However, he had already sworn that Abraham's seed would possess the land, and therefore he raised up a new generation who should go in and possess what their fathers saw but refused to appropriate. And they did. God's purposes cannot miscarry. He will have a people who shall believe their God and possess their possessions. The early generation of Spirit-filled people at the turn of the century took their journey from the blighting wilderness of denominationalism 
and encamped at their Kadesh Barnea on the very doorstep of Canaan, but they too failed to enter in because of unbelief. Some saw the vision, but the majority did not, and they perished in the wilderness. True, there were a few Caleb's and Joshua's who rested in the promises of God and continued to look forward to better things. And God will certainly vindicate His word and His oath and cause them to possess the land with the new generation that God is now raising up. But as a whole, the people who God chose from amongst the denomination and called apart into a new fellowship in the Spirit and baptized with the Holy Ghost, they failed to enter into the land, denounced those who exhorted the people to do so, and turned back into the wilderness like their predecessors in Israel. As surely, therefore, as God's word is true and His oath is immutable, so surely is the Lord now raising up a new generation who shall be empowered to take the promised land of spiritual power and authority and enter into the realm of the Spirit of God. Some must enter therein. If this new generation withdraws from the promises in the face of violent opposition, it too will perish in the wilderness. And God will wait for still another generation to take the land, because some must enter therein. His word has declared it, and it must come to pass. We feel confident, however, that this time God's people will not fail, that in this great hour God himself will intervene in wonderful sovereignty on behalf of those who see the vision and will take them through to complete and glorious victory. We cannot help but believe that this new generation will, by God's grace, cross over the Jordan and possess the kingdom prepared for the little flock from the foundation of the world. And it goes on and says some more, but it's a it's a powerful little article. There's a little more there you could read. I'll make you a copy of it later. But some will enter into all the things that God's promised. There remains for the people of God a rest. Nobody ever yet has entered into it. God's raising up a people in our day. If we'll just trust God, we'll go into what He has for us. I believe that. Bless you.